So it's not really commonly known that the city of Jerusalem, the centre of Jewish culture and religion, was actually rebuilt from scratch during the second century. The city had been completely razed to the ground during the first Jewish-Roman war by Roman forces. But around 60 years later, the Roman Emperor Hadrian ordered a new city to be built on the same spot. But this city would be entirely Greco-Roman and pagan in character rather than Jewish and was given the name of Aelia Capitolina. And in this city were built some prominent temples, a large temple of Jupiter, and a large statue of the god along with a statue of the emperor Hadrian stood on the temple mount where the Jewish second temple first stood and where the Muslim shrine dome of the rock in the foreground of this image now stands and the temple of Aphrodite stood on the exact spot where the church of the holy sepulchre now stands in the western end of the walled city. But these temples were razed to the ground along with the two large statues and the city during the 4th century became to all intents and purposes a Christian city and a a place for pilgrimage. And the city was also renamed Jerusalem and the name Aelia Capitolina abandoned and slowly disappeared from usage. So how did this come about? Let's take a closer look into what happened, why, when and how the temples were originally built and when and how these temples of the city vanished in later centuries. So a quick overview of the history of Jerusalem and how the Roman temples came to be there in the first place. During the early decades of the first century, Jerusalem being the Jewish holy city naturally had a heavy Jewish population, although there was a a strong sprinkling of non-Jews, Greeks and Romans amongst others. Where the Dome of the Rock Shrine now stands was where the Jewish Holy of Holies, the second temple, stood on the Temple Mount up to the first century. And this was in the eastern half of the city and was a large enclosed and walled structure and therefore easy defendable. There was also the fortress of Antonia adjacent to it on the north wall of the Temple Mount. The rest of the walled city lay to the north and west of the Temple Mount. The city and country had come under the influence and indirect rule of the Romans in the previous century and there was a pretty strong Hellenic influence, not just in Judea but all along the eastern Mediterranean. But the walled city never had any pagan temples during this early Roman period and that was to placate the Jews who wouldn't have tolerated pagan temples within the city walls. And the Romans were quite happy with this arrangement if the Jews accepted Roman rule as well. But this all changed after the Jewish-Roman wars of the 1st and 2nd century. The Jews would rebel against the Romans no less than three times, not including various smaller uprisings. The wars also took place within a a fairly short period of 70 years odd and completely changed the face of the region. These never-ending Jewish uprisings very much annoyed the Romans and the Emperor Hadrian during his rule decided to end the Jewish domination of the region and the city of Jerusalem permanently and he expelled the Jews triggering off what we know today as the Jewish diaspora from the region. So what happened during and after the First Jewish War was pretty dramatic, so let's take a closer look at that conflict. The war took place between 66 and 73 CE and the city of Jerusalem came under quite a lengthy siege for around five months during the middle of that conflict in 70 CE. And this siege was led by the general and future emperor Titus who was accompanied by four legions along with quite a few auxiliaries and other local allies. It has to be said that the Jews did put up a tough fight, but the Romans managed to breach the first two walls in the north of the city within three weeks. But the third and strongest wall wouldn't be breached for several months. But the city eventually fell and the whole metropolis, along with the second temple on the Temple Mount, was entirely razed to the ground as a punitive action. And this was to teach the Jews a lesson as they were proving so troublesome. Much of the loot in the city, including what was found in the Second Temple, was taken to Rome and paraded around in triumph by Titus and his troops. The Romans also massacred a huge number of the population, taking no less than 97,000 Jews as slaves, with a, a lot of these being used as gladiators in Roman arenas, while others were used as slave labour for the construction of the Colosseum and, uh, somewhat ironically, the Forum of Peace. But the destroyed city would be left in ruins as an example for others thinking of rebelling against Roman rule. The whole of Judea became desert, the Roman historian Cassius Dio would write later. And Josephus, a Jewish ex-general and chronicler of the war, and who was present at the siege having switched sides to the Romans earlier during the conflict, is the primary source for the information we have on the war. And he also writes a, a graphic account of the situation prevailing in the city after its fall. The city, he wrote, quote, was so thoroughly raised to the ground by those that demolished it to its foundations that nothing was left that could ever persuade visitors that it had once been a place of habitation. And by the way, if you'd like to read the first-hand account of the Jewish historian Josephus and and, uh, what we have left of Cassius Dio's work, I've left links to these books below in the description.
So that's pretty much the way things would stay for the next 60 years or until the year 130 CE. And that was the year that the emperor at that time, Hadrian, decided to build a new city at the same location. Hadrian had come to power in 117 CE and was a pretty dynamic character travelling around the empire personally and overseeing construction projects. But this wouldn't be a Jewish city in character anymore, but a a specifically much more Greco-Roman affair. And he called the new city Aelia Capitolina. The name Aelia was derived from Hadrian's family name, Aelius, and uh, Capitolina was a, a nod to the Capitoline Hill and the temple dedicated to Jupiter on the site. And several important temples were built in the new city during its construction. A temple to Jupiter himself now stood in the prominent place where the Jewish second temple had been on the Temple Mount, along with large statues of Jupiter and of Hadrian himself. And Hadrian would build a magnificent temple to Venus or Aphrodite in the city as well. Venus happened to be the family deity of Hadrian's family and therefore he had a personal interest in the goddess. And Aphrodite also happened to be the special favourite goddess of the 10th legion that was now garrisoning the the new city. So it made perfect sense to have a, a temple sacred to this particular goddess situated in the city. Unfortunately we don't really have any eyewitness accounts of what the Temple of Venus looked like, the structure and its dimensions and so on. But we do know there was also a temple dedicated to the goddess Lapius as well. And the new city was well laid out in Roman fashion with two wide streets running from north to south as well as others running east to west. So the new city quickly came to life but it was also effectively a military colony and what dominated the metropolis at the time was the large military camp of the garrison, the 10th legion stationed in the the south of the city. Later Christian sources would blame Hadrian for building the Temple of Venus on the site of what they said was the tomb of Jesus. He had, they said, deliberately built the temple on the site to bury the remains of the cave where Jesus had been buried. However, Hadrian had never showed any great animus towards Christians or had never persecuted them, so this seems a little far-fetched. And it's important to remember Jerusalem had never been a pilgrimage destination for Christians at that time anyway. But let's go through several of these accusations by the various Christian authors and chroniclers as they are interesting glimpses into the way they perceived things. Eusebius, the bishop of nearby Caesarea Maritima, in his book Vita Constantini, or Life of Constantine, mentions the Temple of Aphrodite that formerly occupied the site where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built, but curiously fails to mention the statue of Jupiter or a Capitolium. He leaves the most colourful accounts of proceedings attacking both Hadrian and the Roman authorities of the time. Quote, once upon a time, wicked men, or rather the whole tribe of demons through them, had striven to consign to darkness and oblivion that divine monument to immortality, meaning the tomb of Jesus. It was this very cave of the saviour that some godless and wicked people had planned to make invisible to mankind, thinking in their stupidity that they could in this way hide the truth. And then he describes the building of the Temple of Aphrodite on the site in equally colourful fashion. Quote, indeed, with a great expenditure of effort, they brought earth from somewhere outside and covered up the whole place, then levelled it, paved it, and so hid the divine cave somewhere down beneath a great quantity of soil. Then, as though they had everything finished and above the ground, they constructed a terrible and truly genuine tomb, one for souls, for dead idols, and built a gloomy sanctuary to the impure demon of Aphrodite. Then they offered foul sacrifices there upon defiled and polluted altars. They reckoned there was one way alone and no other to bring their desires to realisation, and that was to bury the Saviour's cave under such foul pollutions. St Jerome the fourth, early 5th century theologian, also mentions the Temple of Jupiter standing on the Temple Mount and a, a marble statue of Venus on the rock where the crucifixion took place. Quote, where once was the temple and the reverence of God, there is a statue of Hadrian and an image of Jupiter has been erected. And the construction of the temples is also mentioned by Sulpicius Severus, a Christian Roman writing around 403 CE. And in his summary of the reign of Hadrian, Severus refers briefly to the suppression of the Jewish revolt, putting a a heavily pro-Christian tint on matters. Quote, at that time, Hadrian, thinking that he would destroy the Christian faith by causing injury to the place, erected statues of demons in both the temple and in the place of the Lord's Passion. And other writers also mention these temples in brief. For example, Oregon, the second century Christian theologian, mentions the statues of Hadrian and Gaius or Titus on the former site of the temple and tries to relate that to uh, Daniel's abomination of desolation. But I'll leave the last word to Cassius Dio, the uh, pagan Roman historian who records the actions of Hadrian in reviving the city and the events that followed. 
Quote, at Jerusalem, Hadrian founded a city in place of the one which had been raised to the ground, naming it Aelia Capitolina, and on the site of the temple of the god, he raised a new temple to Jupiter. This brought on a war of no slight importance, nor of brief duration, for the Jews deemed it intolerable that foreign races should be settled in their city and foreign religious rites planted there. And that neatly leads us on to the reason for the third Jewish revolt against Roman power. The building of this temple and the fact that it was built on the same site as the second temple uh, was pretty much the reason for the war. If the Jews weren't upset already with the Roman domination and taxes, they certainly didn't like the idea of pagan temples in the city of Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem technically didn't exist anymore. However, the Jews would lose this war as well, and uh, to put an end to matters, Hadrian would entirely eliminate the whole province of Judea, renaming it Syria-Palestina, to ensure it lost its ties with Judaism. Jews were also banned from living in Jerusalem after the Third War. However, there is evidence to suggest this didn't last long and they seem to have returned to the province by the time of the Byzantine period. So let's fast forward 200 years to the reign of Constantine, the first Christian emperor. And it was in the year 324 CE that Constantine officially renamed the city back to Jerusalem. And to raise the presence of the city, he would decide to get rid of the Temple of Venus and build his Church of the Holy Sepulchre at exactly the same spot. Eusebius mentions this decision in the life of Constantine. Quote, such was the situation when another memorable work of great importance was done in the province of Palestine by the God Beloved, meaning Constantine. It was this, he decided that he ought to make universally famous and revered the most blessed site in Jerusalem of the Saviour's resurrection. So at once he gave orders for a place of worship to be constructed, conceiving this idea not without God, but with his spirit moved by the Saviour himself. So orders for the pulling down of the Temple of Venus were issued around the year 326 CE. And uh, Eusebius in the life of Constantine mentions that the ruins of the temple were entirely rejected being pagan. Quote, possessed therefore by the divine spirit, he did not negligently allow that place which has been described to remain smothered by all sorts of filthy rubbish through the machination of enemies consigned to oblivion and ignorance. At a word of command, these contrivances of fraud were demolished from top to bottom and the houses of error were dismantled and destroyed along with their idols and demons. His efforts, however, did not stop there, but the emperor gave further orders that all the rubble of stones and timber from the demolitions should be taken and dumped a long way from the site. This command also was soon effected, but not even this progress was by itself enough. But under divine inspiration, once more the emperor gave instructions that the site should be excavated to a great depth and the pavement should be carried away with the rubble a long distance outside because it was stained with demonic bloodshed. This also was completed straight away. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was straight away built on the ruins of the temple and Eusebius quotes the letter Constantine would write to uh, Macarius, Bishop of Jerusalem, giving him carte blanche to effectively spend as much as he wished with the imperial treasury at his disposal. Quote, the thing therefore which I consider clear to everybody is what I want you in particular to believe, namely that above all else my concern is that the sacred place which at God's command I have now relieved of the hideous burden of an idol which lay on it like a weight, hallowed from the start by God's decree, and now proved yet holier since it brought to light the pledge of the Saviour's passion, should be adorned by us with beautiful buildings. And the new church was dedicated on 13th September 335 CE. And this meant that Jerusalem now rapidly became a centre for pilgrimage for Christians. And this was something new for during the 1st, 2nd and 3rd centuries, Jerusalem had no great attachment for Christians and was never a place to travel to. On a side note, on building the church, they conveniently found a tomb underneath. Uh, now, that would have been no surprise as there must have been numerous tombs and caves in and around Jerusalem. But this particular cave was happily assumed to have been Jesus's burial place, despite no real evidence to suggest this. And this construction of the church meant we do have some contemporary or near contemporary accounts still existing of Jerusalem or Aelia Capitolina as it was still called then. Although with the empire now Christian under Constantine, the, the old name of Jerusalem was now resurfacing. However, unfortunately, these visitors were Christians and therefore had no interest in the pagan temples or even of writing about them, except uh, perhaps as a minor anecdote from a, a greater description of Christian Jerusalem. The very earliest witness is known as the Bordeaux Pilgrim. 
And he or she was an early Christian traveller from Europe who went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in 333 CE. In other words, during the reign of Constantine. The journal kept by the Bordeaux pilgrim is known as the Itinerarium Burdigalense, or the Burgundy Itinerary in English. And by the time the Bordeaux pilgrim reached Jerusalem, the temple no longer existed and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was in the stage of being built since it was consecrated in 336. But the pilgrim interestingly does mention the existence of Roman statues on the Temple Mount. Quote, there are two statues of Hadrian and not far from the statues there is a perforated stone to which the Jews come every year and anoint it, bewail themselves with groans, rend their garments and so depart. Now, the pilgrim probably made a mistake as it's thought the second statue was in all probability that of Antoninus Pius, a statue that was erected somewhat later than the one of Hadrian. But interestingly, he does mention the Wailing Wall or what we call the Wailing Wall now, which is what's left of the retaining wall that surrounded the Temple Mount. So even during those times, the Jews had turned this into a place of prayer and pilgrimage, mourning the loss of the temple. The Bordeaux Pilgrim's account is fairly brief, unfortunately, but around 50 years after that, sometime around 381 to 384 CE, we have another account of Jerusalem from another pilgrim, another woman who seems to be of high station and wealthy and who has actually written one of the best accounts of early Christian Jerusalem. And that was a woman called Egeria or Etheria. And you can read her very interesting account in the, the Pilgrimage of Egeria, in which she describes her journeys to Jerusalem and surrounding areas. Egeria travelled across the Mediterranean to Egypt through Sinai, visiting the various monasteries and sites before going to Palestine. She doesn't mention the Temple of Venus, of course, as that was now a history, but neither does she mention the Temple of Jupiter on the Temple Mount either. However, interestingly, she calls Jerusalem by the name Aelia, suggesting the name was still in currency even by the late 4th century. Egeria does go into pretty heavy detail on describing the various churches and their services and liturgies in Jerusalem and other areas, so definitely worth a read if you want to read what Jerusalem was like in the 4th century. A few years later, St. Jerome, writing in 398 CE, does mention that an equestrian statue of Adrian was still standing on the Temple Mount, but he doesn't mention the, the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, and we have to presume that it was pulled down by the Christians by this time. Quote, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation or to the statue of the mounted Hadrian which stands to this very day on the site of the Holy of Holies. Now the general consensus is that the Christians either destroyed these statues of Hadrian and Antoninus Pius shortly after that as the city became a Christian stronghold or on the chance that the statue and temple of Jupiter still existed even in ruins then the Jews in 614 must have destroyed it. And this was during the Byzantine-Persian War, uh, when the city was captured by the Persians for a short period and who gave over control of the city to the Jews. And if by any chance the ruins of either the temple or the, or the statues still existed, they would have been destroyed by the Muslim Arabs who conquered the city in AD 638. And on the Temple Mount, the Muslims would build the, the Dome of the Rock Shrine in the later 7th century. So this successive rising to the ground by uh, Christians, then Jews, and then Muslims means any trace of these structures has uh, pretty much vanished. The only other important temple in Jerusalem was uh, to the north of the Temple Mount, and that was the Temple of Asclepius. But with the banning of worship at pagan temples during the 4th century, this temple was also closed down and began falling into ruin. And we do know the ruins were knocked down and a Byzantine basilica was built over its foundations in the 5th century. And that pretty much completed the removal of pagan temples in the city and the Christianisation of what was first an entirely Jewish and then a, a pagan city. Somewhat ironically for a holy place, Jerusalem has one of the more sadder and unhappier histories of any major Christian centre. There has been various fires, riots and earthquakes throughout the centuries, but most importantly there has been a lot of bloodshed, violence and wars in that area as well. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre especially hasn't had a, a very fortunate history. The city was captured in 614 CE by the Persians during the Byzantine-Persian War and in the resulting fire in the city the church was completely destroyed. However, it didn't stay in Persian hands too long and the city was recaptured by the Byzantines in 629 by the Emperor Heraclius and the church was rebuilt between 616 and 626 CE. But this recapture wouldn't last long. Byzantine Jerusalem was conquered by the Arab armies in 638 and bringing about an end to Christian control of the city for nearly 500 years till the First Crusade. 
Interestingly, the Arabs have renamed it to its former name, calling it Ilia, or uh, a corruption of Alia Capitolina. And the Temple Mount was now named Medina Beit al Maqdis, meaning City of the Temple. And we do have some accounts of the Temple Mount where the Arabs were busy demolishing what was left of the ruins of the temple and the statues and constructing what would be the precursor to the Al Aqsa Mosque that exists there even now today. And and this early mosque we, was built, we know, during the time of Sophronius, the patriarch of Jerusalem during the city's capture. Another chronicler, Anastasius of Sinai, writes that around 660 CE, he saw Egyptian workers clearing the Temple Mount, presumably in preparation for building the mosque. And the debris from the clearing up, presumably some of the uh, statues and, and, and the temple or, or the ruins off, was thrown, he says, into the Kidron Valley, adjacent to the Temple Mount. Meanwhile, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre from 746 to 1009 went through a, a series of more misfortunes before being demolished by the Caliph al-Hakim bin Amarallah in 1009. It was then rebuilt by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine Monomachus in 1048, shortly before the Crusades. And the Crusaders, after they conquered the city, would do some extensive rebuilding as well. And that's it for the short history of pagan Jerusalem, which lasted from 130 CE to 324 CE. So if you're visiting the city and naturally visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, be sure to remember there was a Temple of Aphrodite there in the first place. And similarly on the Temple Mount, seen in the foreground of this image, that there was a Temple of Jupiter standing on the hill. And of course, modern research and archaeology may have uncovered more information about these structures by now. So do look into that. Anyway, thanks for watching. And a, a reminder, if you'd like to read any of the accounts mentioned in this video, I've left links to them below in the description. Finally, if you enjoyed this video, do consider giving it a like and the channel a subscribe.